I think I know everyone in this room, more or less. But I'm Tony. I'm a pharmacist here at Fort Chan Sherbrooke. And uh, I am going to talk to you about some research we've been doing with heterosexual men living with HIV over the past few years. And some of the ups and downs that have been associated with it. So why should we be doing research with heterosexual men with HIV? So first of all, they are increasingly represented among the population of persons with HIV in Ontario. So if you look at the stats pre-1995, it was fewer than 5% of all men with HIV who had acquired HIV through heterosexual sex. Um, if you look up until uh, 2011, I suppose I could have updated that number, but if you look at 2011, for example, anywhere from 13.5% to 28.2% of new diagnoses among men would have been in the heterosexual category. And that the reason that number is so wide is because of the way we capture uh, risk factor, right? So the lower bound would be only those men who had HIV transmission as their risk factor checked off. The upper bound includes all the men who have come from to Canada from endemic countries, the majority of whom are going to be have acquired HIV through heterosexual sex. So the real number is probably somewhere in between. But it's it's been increasing quite steadily over time. And so that's the sort of, that would be new diagnoses or incident cases. And so the prevalence is anywhere from 9.7 to 17% of all men, 17 point something, I forgot something after the decimal, 17 point something percent of all men living with, with HIV. And we know that as, as um, our patients live longer, they're going to need more programs, they're going to need more services. And the question always has been, around straight men anyway, does the existing complement of services really meet their needs? Because this is, if you think about the way HIV services and the HIV programs in Ontario anyway developed, they were really rooted in or connect, closely connected to the history of, of uh, mobilization by the gay community in Ontario when there was really nothing for HIV in the 80s, and later by some political action by women. So um, these guys have really been left behind, and there hasn't really been much of there hasn't really been much in the way of engagement with this community by researchers, by policymakers over time. They're not even really listed as a priority population unless they're slotted in um, a category like endemic from an endemic country. So we set out to do a first study. And all we really wanted to know in this study actually was um, we wanted to characterize the help-seeking experiences of heterosexual men living with HIV. So we want to understand what is it like if you're a heterosexual man with HIV trying to access care in Ontario today. So we wanted to do that, and then we also wanted to, no, we didn't just want to describe them, we wanted to also explain these experiences in relation to the social relationships and the discourses in which care is embedded. And by discourses, we mean uh, language, images, symbols that are used to inform care or, or provide care. So we wanted to do those two things in, in the context of this, of this study. And that was to address that gap around what is it like to be a straight man with HIV trying to access care in, in Ontario. So we did a qualitative study for this, uh, for this question, to answer this question. And so, so like most qualitative studies, our sampling was not meant for statistical generalizability. It was purposive sampling, right? So we wanted to select a sample of men that could actually speak to these experiences. So we sought uh, men who are over the age of 18, who have at least engaged with the healthcare system and aid service organizations in some capacity during the, during the course of their um, trajectory as being HIV positive. And because of the, um, because men from Africa and the Caribbean are overly represented in this group, we set a minimum quota of two focus groups of men from these communities to, to, uh, to research. And we did use focus groups, which caused a little bit of discussion because men typically don't relate to each other in group settings. They like to, they're, they're more comfortable in one-on-one -on -one settings. But in, often in qualitative research, there's a lot of data just in the interaction itself versus what people are saying to you. So we thought we'd try focus groups and they were actually hugely successful because for many of these guys it was the only it was the first opportunity they'd had to see another uh, heterosexual man with HIV so the groups had a bit of a cathartic um, element as well and then to end because we also wanted to do some explanation in this study not just description we, we, we used some theory to analyze the data so we used um, a guy named Pierre Bourdieu he's a sociologist from France who did both quantitative and qualitative research but he has a conceptual arsenal that he calls structural constructivism and it's really a set of tools that allows you to relate the subjective accounts of people to their social relate to the broader social networks and discourses in which help seeking could be um, could be happening. And we also used Irving Goffman's stigma. I don't know if Irving Goffman's a Canadian sociologist who wrote a lot of books um, in the fifties and sixties. And one of them, one of the most famous ones, is a book called Stigma: Notes on a Spoiled Identity. 
um, which is actually a great read and very light read. Very his writing is very unlike Bourdieu, who's Bourdieu. very Bourdieu is very dense and thick. Uh, Goffman is very conversational um, and and uh, and very easy to read, but a great book. And then we integrated the, those theories with um, with something called constructionist grounded theory. This was how we approached the data. So a combination of coding and memo writing that was integrated with these um, theoretical perspectives to try to come up with not just a characterization of their experiences, but explanations for what might be happening. So we came up with some concepts to uh, from this study. The first was this concept of spatially acquired stigma and the discrediting potential of help seeking. So in many of the social circles that heterosexual men with HIV navigate, there's still a lot of problematic imputations that come with being HIV positive, about the type of person that becomes HIV positive. And these imputations become almost grafted onto the clinics and the aid service organizations that provide care to people with HIV. And in their social networks, the, the, the men characterize them as being called AIDS buildings, for example. And so because these men do a lot of work to try to manage disclosure around their illness, being enga engaging with these sites becomes potentially discrediting, right? Because it, becomes, it can undermine all the work that they've been doing trying to manage information about their illness and disclosure to, within their own social networks. So there's a great deal of fear about being seen by their bosses, for example, entering these places, um, being seen by family or friends entering these places. And so um, they will either try to avoid it altogether, um, not, not enter these, so not enter any place that has the word, say, positive in it or the word HIV in it, or seek care at other sites, so seeking care at walk-in clinics or emergency room departments where it's less conspicuous, right, that these are, these are places for HIV treatment. Um, or they'll do a great deal of work to try to time it, right? So if they know their boss has a meeting at 1 o'clock, they're going to try to set up their appointment at 1 o'clock, right? So there's no way their boss could see them going into a site that could be providing HIV-related care. And what's more concerning for them is not just what, what it means for them, what it could mean in terms of social consequences to them to be seen engaging with these sites, but also for their kids in the event that they have children. What will it mean if so-and-so sees my, me going in there and they, our kids play together in the playground well, then they're, 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 will they not allow their kid to play with my kid? That sort of thing also comes up. So whether the, the, this, this stigma can be sort of transferred in a sort of linear fashion down to their, their kids is another concern for them, another reason why they, they do a great deal of work to try to manage when they go to these places if they go to them at all. The second concept was particular to aid service organizations, and it, we called it spatial marginalization, being mismatched and poorly positioned at aid service organizations. This was particularly uh, something that came up in the urban settings where the history of aid service organizations is closely tied to uh, political action by the gay community. But so help seeking at these agencies does occur in a network of social relationships, right? And it's not just feeling ill at ease in these spaces. That was, that, that was part of it, feeling ill at ease in a space that was dominated by gay men in terms of clientele and staff. But these sites also, these places all become sites of contention and power struggles for heterosexual men with HIV because they feel that they don't have the proper social connections to um, get the attention of the dominant, of the decision-making apparatuses within these organizations, which are dominated mostly by gay men and by women. So because of that, they don't feel like they can get any traction when it comes to developing peer support programs for themselves or developing social uh, programs for themselves. And in the event they get anything like that, on more than one occasion, in more than one group, the, they were able to describe experiences where there were social intrusions uh, or intrusions on their time. So they would be having a, a lunch for them for their demographic, and then somebody would walk in and start helping themselves to their food. And this actually happened in one of the focus groups. We were, having, we were doing a focus group, and some of the ASO staff came in and started helping themselves to the food in the middle of the focus group. So I literally, it was almost on cue. Actually, as a guy was describing it, the staff walked in and started. Um, so they describe it as a sort of power, uh, a place of, of a really where they're poorly positioned because they don't have the right social connections to succeed. And so because of that, they can never get any traction for their respective demographic. It's interesting if you, change, if you, look, if you flip the context a little bit, if you go to uh, settings where there isn't this connection of aid service organizations with, um, with, gay politi with a history of gay political action. So if you go to more remote settings, aid service organizations have a different um, spin to heterosexual men. They're more sites of asylum. Um, from a world, from a so from a sort of heteronormative world that doesn't understand them, this is a place where they can go for support and where they can be understood. But these places also are much less visibly marked or labeled as being places for HIV care. Right? There's no rainbow flag outside. There's no sign. You can walk by it and not know that it, it's an aid service organization at all. And the third concept we came up with was this idea of lacking symbolic appeal when seeking help. 
So this is um, what, what these men perceive is that unlike heterosexual men, heterosexual women have done quite well, actually, at getting the attention of funders and clinicians and researchers. And the reason for that is because the, it, it's, it's not, so unlike being poorly positioned at aid service organizations, the problem isn't being lack of a, isn't the lack of a dominant, a membership in a dominant group. The problem is being contextually transformed into the problem of HIV in women. So these men have actually taken up this discourse that's called the vulnerability discourse, the vulnerability paradigm that's described by some feminist researchers, which is this group of symbols and language and images that women with HIV have used to advance an agenda for themselves, right? This idea of the vulnerable woman, the woman being vulnerable to HIV. And this, by default, almost has categorically positioned heterosexual men as being the uh, criminals or the victimizers or the perpetrators in this context. And it was very common for men to use this kind of language where women were victims. So they've actually even taken it up. Women were victims and they were criminals, they were perpetrators, they were victimizers. And so in this setting, they see that women have greater symbolic appeal. They are guilty of creating HIV positive victims for whom help and sympathy and support are warranted. And why would you help the criminal then? So while men and women can both be stigmatized by HIV, these men then have also become morally ostracized in some ways by virtue of becoming the problem of HIV infection in women. And so they see themselves as being poorly positioned because of that kind of discourse. So why would you help them when you could be help spending resources instead of helping the, the victims in this, in this sort of uh, um, dyad? So when, when taken together then, if you look at it, uh, heterosexual men be, are disadvantaged by their poor configuration of capital relative to gay men and heterosexual women. So relative to gay men, they, have, they don't have the social capital of gay men in aid service organizations and for succeeding in funding. So they, gay men benefit by virtue of, being member, of having membership with the dominant group in these organizations. And with respect to heterosexual women, they're endowed with something we call negative symbolic capital. So this is derived from being produced as the problem in the context of heterosexual HIV transmission. So taken together, then, these men perceive themselves as being an afterthought whenever decisions around funding and programming and, and those sorts of decisions get made uh, by, by the individuals who can make those decisions, who are often part of those, of those groups. So these men try to do stuff, actually, to try to counter this, this lack of capital, this problem of not having the right capital. So at aid service organizations, volunteering to them is actually seen as a way to try to gain recognition and try to gain respect from the dominant uh, networks who make decisions. So they're doing this as it's a strategic thing. It's not just that they're volunteering, they're doing this strategically to try to gain recognition from the dominant group. And interestingly, sometimes they try to pass as gay men. So because they think there's an embodied um, advantage, actually, that there's a gay body language, some of these men actually spend time studying uh, what they think is gay body language by watching gay men interact with one another and will try to get into a, uh, an aid service, or try, try to apply for positions at aid service organizations and try to see if they can pass as... As, as gay men, um, and do that, which is actually quite fascinating to, to, uh, to learn about in the course of doing this study. So interestingly, this, these were all strategies that they used to try to gain the right social capital. There was very little talk about this negative, trying to counter this perception of being victimizers or criminals. And I think part of that is they've also taken it up. There, there wasn't a lot of resisting of it. It was really, it was it was out there, it was a real thing, they'd taken it up as being fact, so there wasn't really much in the way of them doing anything to try to challenge it. So this was the first real sort of large, in-depth, critical examination of the help-seeking experiences of heterosexual men with HIV, but we did have some limitations. I mean, and this was partly because of the nature of the study, but we didn't look at, we didn't look at men who were not engaged in care, and this was because, again, we wanted to understand what it was like to be in care, right? So this is, so we didn't sample those men. It would probably be very different, though, to hear from those guys or other stakeholders like clinicians or staff of aid service organizations. But again, because this was really the first study looking at this kind of experience, we wanted to hear only from the, from the men. But one of the guys during the, so some of the implications of the study were the need for, around the social capital anyway, around generating social capital, is the need to involve men, heterosexual men more in research and in programming and policy. So extending the GIPA and MIPA principles to this community to afford them an opportunity to build social capital with researchers and policymakers and give them more say when decisions around programming are made. Yes. So greater involvement of people with AIDS and meaningful involvement of people with HIV and AIDS. Sorry. Um, so those were some of the implications we came out of the study. But then it was interesting that some of the men started saying, would, would say to me at the end of the focus group, so 
what are you going to do now? Like, are you just going to be one of those researchers who shows up, gets your gets your data, publishes a paper, and we never hear from you again? Which was a very good question, actually, because that's pretty much what happens, right? And I was actually quite prepared to do that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, actually. Um, but uh, it was a good question. So we thought, well, we could try to do something else. So why don't we try doing this? Let's, let's try uh, getting a community advisory board of straight men with HIV together to guide more research. And let's try to plan a summit, like a summit for straight men with HIV. There's often, there's, there's, there's events for women, there's events for gay men. You don't often see events for, for straight men with HIV. So we did. We had a summit, and we called it Involving Heterosexual Men Living with HIV and Developing a Research and Policy Agenda for Their Community. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to host this summit for a few reasons. One was just to provide an opportunity for networking. It was a way for these men to have a social well-being and to meet other men, uh, because again, they're so isolated uh, from one another in many cases, and there isn't a space for them to go to. Um, and provide an opportunity to try to build that sense of community. And also then to, uh, to try to conduct roundtable discussions to identify research and advocacy priorities. So this was done with a community advisory board. So first we recruited a uh, set men to help put this together, and this was what this was all sort of stemming from their ideas, right? We were just the um, money, basically. We were just providing the money, but they were providing most of the ideas and the work around it. So, so there was a core group of community members who were involved in planning. And then we reached out to eight service organizations across the province because we wanted some geographic representation. So we, wor we uh, worked with ASOs across the province to identify potential participants. So we had some, we didn't want just people showing up for free food, right? We wanted them to be able to speak to some of these things, right? So we asked the ASOs if they knew of participants who would be um, suitable for, it for this day. So our sampling was obviously not random, but based on a desire for representation according to geography in Ontario. So we wanted to make sure we had Northern Ontario, et cetera, country of origin and mode of acquisition. Despite all this though, despite our best efforts, we didn't get a lot of people, we didn't get some groups we really tried hard to get. So we got no Aboriginal men, for example, uh, despite a lot of attempts. We got no trans men in this first go. Um, and we got, um, we had men who were infected very young as hemophiliacs, but we didn't have any men who were perinatally infected. Uh, as part of this group. We just never heard, we never got any response, actually. So it wasn't like we, were, we even got to approach anybody. We just, the different, uh, we, re we repeatedly tried to meet with the different agencies, uh, the, and we just never heard back. We use a method called the World Cafe method. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this method, but so normally if you go to these things, there's a bunch of breakout sessions, right, and everybody comes back and reports. Instead, we, actually, this was something a community member came up with that I had never heard of it before, and then I had to read about it. Um, but this is this idea of the, of the World Cafe is literally the room is set up like a cafe and at each table um, there's a person who facilitates the conversation and then you have your four or five participants per table so each table has a, a, a specific question that, that is being addressed and then the participants rotate among the tables so after about 20 or 30 minutes of discussion the participants rotate and so when a new set of participants come the person who facilitates the discussion summarizes what was discussed for the new participants, and that gives the, the idea is that the new participants then have an opportunity to respond to, react to, build on, uh, challenge, whatever has been discussed already. So it's a, the idea is to have these multi-layered discussions rather than everyone breaking away and coming back and reporting back to a larger group. So it's exactly that. Participants rotate among the tables in the room so each individual has an opportunity to speak to each, to each issue. And the only person who doesn't move is the facilitator and note taker. And the discussion questions were developed again by the, so the facilitator and note taker was a, were community members. So this was again run by community uh, members who were taking the notes. And the discussion questions were also developed by community members. So it was questions, they divided them into four domains. So questions around advocacy and community building, like what are some messages about heterosexual men that we need to get out there? Questions about programming, so what are some ways to involve heterosexual men? These are just examples uh, for each domain, but what are some ways to involve heterosexual men in providing input on programs and services? How can heterosexual men be meaningfully engaged in research? And then what are some of the gaps in social support services? And then data, we, data were recorded all over the room. So flip charts, notepads, um, and summaries of large group discussions. And then the men and I, again, the community member, a few community members and I, then we just did a very quick summary of them by uh, nothing really complicated, content and thematic analysis, just to categorize them into, into groups. So they generated three main categories, actually. So first is this idea of not, not being recognized at all. So if you look at all of the 
if you look all over, if you look at who priority populations are, who priority groups are for funding, they're not really recognized as being a priority population, they're being an at-risk population. So this need to create an identity for themselves, uh, a need to challenge negative stereotypes of heterosexual men with HIV, and being meaningfully, identifying priorities for themselves and being meaningfully engaged in research. So, this was, so then what, what we did is we looked at the, each group, so we had like non-recognition, what the consequences were, how they defined it, and what the steps would be to make it happen. So for example, one of the consequences would be having no power, and then uh, consequently no input into decision making. So they felt that they needed to increase their visibility by having some sort of name, a logo, and champions for themselves. They needed to have um, people from within the community who would be champions for their community. Um, they thought that this lack of programming, they should meet with ASOs and, and, and encourage positions within aid service organizations. Um, they thought, they noticed that there's a lot of gaps in healthcare, particularly around men being diagnosed late with, with heterosexual, heterosexual men being diagnosed late because often not considered, they're not considered an at-risk group, so that there would need to be an increased awareness among clinicians. And this uh, issue around, uh, one of the consequences of non-recognition is actually, in, is, is for the group having stigma and low self-esteem and a fear of disclosure. So. Um, more opportunities like the one that they had, like for training in, in community-based research. But they also realized there were challenges in doing this, right? So there were, or there have been previous attempts at trying to create a group identity for heterosexual men with HIV, but it just always seemed to fall apart for a few reasons. And some of the ones, some of the participants who were around for, for some of these earlier attempts were able to speak to this, but there was no real champion, right? Nobody would really, because of this this double-edged sword, right, of the stigma and the non-disclosure, nobody would really step forward and assume that mantle of being the, the champion or two that would uh, push this forward. That some of the early groups are just an overemphasis on social aspects, so just meeting women, dating, um, going to base, like, and not enough real advocacy. It was all about the social, about relationships and getting together, but nothing around advocacy and, um, and a lot of internal dissent, apparently, in some of the early groups. So not, not a lot of cohesion, not, not a lot of cooperation, and sometimes even just described as outright um, internal infighting that caused things to just sort of come apart. And this is something that they described, but I found, actually, as I was doing this work over the past few years, it's because of disclosure and stigma, it becomes hard to recruit others and sustain growth. Um, and inevitably, people move on, right? So community members come and go, as you do community-based, if you do community-based research, you find people move in and out. But if you're dealing with a group that's very afraid to come out, and you only have a small pocket to work with, to begin with, if you start to lose them, it becomes very difficult to get others to come participate. Around challenging negative stereotypes, there is this, you know, again, there was this, they, they were talking, they talked a lot, particularly men from the African Caribbean regions, around the uh, harmful, st of, of men being dangerous to communities, to, to, particularly to white women. If you look at the, uh, at who gets portrayed in the media as being a, a problem, it's often an African man who has not disclosed that he's HIV positive to usually often a, a white soccer mom or something like that. So there's a lot of this kinds of media portrayals of, of these men being these mysterious sort of foreigners bringing in their their particular strain of HIV is often there's, there's that kind of language to to our communities and being dangerous that way so they talked a lot about these media portrayals the criminalization of HIV which disproportionately affects this community actually disproportionately affects heterosexual men with HIV more than any other community and then the overlay of racial stereotypes that adds further to to the stigma but the, again there was not a lot of talk about how to counter this right there was like I don't know what to do. And other than, particularly around criminalization, this is an issue that is not just, even though it disproportionately affects straight men, it, it's something that other communities in the HIV sort of group are affected by, and that maybe some sort of uh, cross-collaboration with these other communities would be helpful in trying to challenge these stereotypes. And then there was a lot of talk around research priorities. So for example, I'm not going to go through all of them, but things like treatment of HIV and its complications. So looking at health and treatment issues for heterosexual men with HIV. So things like access to treatment for hep C, um, differences in outcomes according to ethnicity and age, the health of heterosexual men with HIV in Ontario, which I'm not sure if you can tell, I bolded it there because we were actually able, I'll show you we actually did that um, um, as a next step. But also looking at things around access to and disparities in care among heterosexual men with HIV that are specific for um, things like mental health, um, prisoners with HIV, um, barriers to cancer screening, social determinant uh, research, effects of stigma, criminalization, housing, and employment, 
and prevention. So a lot more research around primary and secondary prevention of heterosexual transmission. So um, interventions to increase testing in this population, uh, the risk of transmission in discordant couples. Um, family planning was another big priority, actually another big topic of conversation. In contrasting, again, they always they often contrast themselves to women. So in contrast to a lot of the work that goes on around motherhood and the desire for women to have um, children, there's like almost nothing for like the sort of the analogy is, is almost not there. So we actually have funding now to do some of this work around the importance of fatherhood and where men get their information on fertility and that sort of thing. So we'll probably start that this year um, because it does it does seem to keep coming up. And things around coping with diagnosis and impact on social relationships and disclosure were also big topics. So again, we didn't have everyone we wanted there. So we didn't have Aboriginal men, we didn't have perinatally infected men transitioning to adult care, and we didn't have men from the transgender community. But it was a very, for a lot of the participants who were there, they described it as a very um, galvanizing experience, a very um, uplifting day. They had a, it was a very positive day for most of the men there. And they were motivated to do more, actually, which is always a good thing, right, when you get people to want to do more. So we did do more. So we had some knowledge dissemination that was led by community members. So community members presented this stuff at the, presented stuff from the summit at CAR and um, even uh, chaired and presented at a challenge panel at the OHTN, at the OHTN conference in 2013. So there was a, a chairperson was a community member and the one of the presenters was also a community member. Uh, which was actually a big deal to get a challenge panel at the OHTN around this topic. And uh, another community member uh, uh, would set up a bunch of uh, meetings at aid service organizations and we would present and tell me about them the day before. By the way, tomorrow, what are you doing tomorrow? I'll tell you what you're doing tomorrow. You're going to be at PWA. So, so we did some presentations to these knowledge users as well. And then we wanted to build on the summit. Again, there was that, well, what are we going to do next kind of thing, right? So we thought, well, we could do some of it. We could do some research. So we thought we would generate a health profile of heterosexual men with HIV in Ontario using the OCS data. Uh, and because they identified all these research parties, we, would, we, we started doing a scoping review to determine how well research around heterosexual men aligns with the priorities of these men. And then we wanted to do another event, this time not just for straight men, but an event where the men are actually integrated with um, policymakers and people who make decisions around funding, right? So taking it the next step, so not just having another meeting, but let's invite the right people, at the, let's have the right people there now who can actually maybe affect some change. So this, I'm just going to show you quickly the analysis of the OCS and the heterosexual. So this was a student, an epidemiology student actually did this as part of her placement at the OHTN. So Kristen actually presented this last week at, uh, at CAR. So uh, this was OCS participants who completed the last questionnaire in 2010 to 2012 and who identified their gender as man and their orientation as heterosexual on the last interview. And so that left 552 men, uh, heterosexual men, which is actually a fairly large sample of heterosexual men in, in most uh, surveys. So then we just broke them. We did some very dis descriptive stuff. So we looked at, and we, comp we did all of our analyses comparing them to the men who, was, who identified as gay and men who identified as bisexual. So if you look at age distribution, not a lot. Of not a lot of huge difference, especially most, most men clump around the 40 to 59 year old uh, range and not a lot of difference between the groups um, there. But where there is a bit of difference is in terms of the back racial, racial background. So if you look at the first bar, the African Caribbean black, uh, there's a much higher prevalence of, of uh, African Caribbean men in the heterosexual uh, group than there is in either the gay or bisexual group. So some differences by ethnicity. And history of IV drug use, so we looked at just how many of these heterosexual men had a history of IV drug use, so 32% did and 68% did not. We did compare this to gay men, I'm not sure why I didn't put that slide up here, but it was a bit higher for, for this group than it was for gay men. Oh, here it is actually. So with history of, so, uh, so this is hepatitis C infection, so again we have a higher, so the, if you look at the first bar here, on the, first, on the left it's with the history of injection drug use, so heterosexual men uh, Eighty-one point one percent who had a history of injection drug use are also Hep C positive, compared to thirty point seven percent of gay men and sixty-six point seven percent of bisexual men. And if you look at without a history of injection drug use, it's still actually uh, more frequent of prevalence of hepatitis C even in, in uh, heterosexual men. So fifteen point four percent of heterosexual men have hepatitis C co-infection, compared to six percent of gay and bisexual men.
Uh, this is without a history of injection drug use. So there's, there's a greater burden of hepatitis C co-infection in, in heterosexual men in general. The mean CD4 count of diagnosis was statistically different, but I would say clinically not that big of a deal, right? So 319 for heterosexual men, 393 for gay men, and 376 for bisexual men. So all under 400, all, but not probably not a huge deal in terms of clinical importance. Statistically, there was a significant difference, but I'm not sure I would say it was anything sort of clinically important. Where there is a big difference is actually when it comes to late diagnoses. So when you look at men who are, the purple bar is the men who are not diagnosed late and everything green under meets the definition of being diagnosed late. So 40% of heterosexual men are diagnosed late, meaning they're diagnosed either with a CD4 count less than 200 at the time of diagnosis or with an AIDS-defining illness within a year of their diagnosis, um, which is much higher than it is for either gay or bisexual men. And this probably speaks to the fact that they're not considered not risk group, don't get tested as frequently as the other groups and are probably misdiagnosed a lot before they actually do get uh, diagnosed with HIV. Um, in terms of initiation of antiretroviral therapy, there was no real difference. 94, 95%, about 95% of patients in that time frame had initiated antiretroviral therapy as of their last interview date. Um, CD4 accounted last follow-up, also not a big, I mean, there, there are some statistical differences, but again, I would say not clinically that important, about 500. Um, as a CD4 count at the time of last diagnosis, there was a difference, a statistical difference between gay and heterosexual men, but it was only amounted to about 50 cells. But in terms of being suppressed at last follow-up, heterosexual men were actually uh, more likely to be detectable at their last follow-up and having a detectable viral load than, than either gay or bisexual men. So 15% of, of, uh, of heterosexual men had a detectable viral load compared with 9% of gay men and 18% of heterosexual men. So that, that comparison is with gay men. So then we looked at the questions like how many, what's, what's the odds of being in annual care? Um, so this goes from 2001 to 2011. And being in annual care was defined as having at least one viral load or CD4 count per year. And so uh, it was lower for heterosexual men. So the odds of being in annual care, after, this was a crude estimate, but even after we adjusted for a bunch of other demographic variables, um, heterosexual men are less likely to be in annual care, so to at least get one viral load or CD4 count um, in the year than, than gay men or men who have sex with men. And among the men who are in annual care, we then had a second definition of being in continuous care. So this is having at least two viral loads or CD4 counts at least 90 days apart. And again, how do, uh, MS, uh, relative to men who have sex with men, heterosexual men are less likely to be in continuous care. So 90.1% versus 85.9%. And this does speak a little bit to some of that stuff that they were saying in their qualitative uh, study around trying to avoid help seeking as much as possible if they could get away with it. There's some measures of mental health on the Kessler cycle on the uh, OCS. And um, so on some of them, the heterosexual men actually seem to have a greater burden of mental health than either gay men or bisexual men. So there's a, something called the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale, which measures your psychological distress in the past month. I gave it to myself yesterday, too, actually, because I looked it up. I actually came out being very highly distressed. I scored 28. I think 20, I think 30 is your top score. It's terrible. <laughs> so no more referrals to anybody in the room. Uh, yeah. So but how do, so gay men had so sorry, gay men actually had the the lowest levels of psychological distress compared to gay and bisexual to sorry, straight and bisexual men at 33.5 and and 30 percent. And clinical depression was actually highest in bisexual men, followed by heterosexual men and gay men. And then the self-reported general health was most likely to be reported, gay men were most likely to report their health as good or better, followed by bisexual men and then heterosexual men being the least likely to report their health as uh, good or better. So we saw that there, we see from this slide that there's quite a bit of diversity among the HIV positive heterosexual men in Ontario that we look after, but a relatively high burden of injection drug use and hepatitis C co-infection. Um, a, relatively high a relatively high representation of African Caribbean black men and, ab and men who are ab Aboriginal um, origin. Very common, probably too, too unacceptably common, uh, common to have late diagnosis of 40% among this group. Uh, less likely to be in annual care and continuous care. Um, but And a higher prevalence of detectable varima despite being on antiretroviral therapy and a significant amount of mental health morbidity as well, with depression and a higher and psychological distress being common in this in this man.
so these are some of the strengths and limitations of the OCS in general. So you have a large sample size to work with. You have different groups to work with as well, high quality data and a lot of indicators to, to select from. But there are a lot of weaknesses. So like to the, different, the people who participate are probably not the same as the people who don't participate. There's also survival bias. So particularly with the 2010, 11 and 12, they may be different than the participants who were not available for interview in 2010. And there's always missing data in these in these uh, in these uh, data sets that you have to work around. And then I'll just quickly tell you about this scoping review. This was done to look at how well the research priorities of men align with what's been done in the literature. So um, this was done by a community member and a student, and uh, so two reviewers independent. So there was a, a literature search from inception to August 2014. Because we never published it, we keep having to rerun. So the last search was run until 2014. It was actually presented at CAR last week. Um, two reviewers independently read the title and abstract to decide if it should be included. Three reviewers extracted data. I can't remember who the third person is right now. But anyway, there was a third person apparently who extracted data. And then the data was just summarized uh, and using, using the priorities from the sum as a, as a framework. And I'm not going to tell you too much about it other than we found 86 studies that met the criteria for, for being research that involved heterosexual men with HIV. But overall, the priorities of the men weren't reflected so in, these, um, in the type, in type of research that was being done. So it wasn't a lot, for example, on family planning, not a lot around treatment for, of, uh, of, men with, of heterosexual men with HIV, not a lot around their disclosure concerns, psychosocial research for that group. Um, so um, that's, that was presented, as I said. And I'm not, I'm not sure what we'll do with it, actually, with that. But what we actually did do with it is have a follow-up dissemination meeting back to the community. Right, so we shared the findings of the first summit. We then shared the findings of the um, OCS and the findings of a scoping review with a sec at a second summit for heterosexual men with HIV that we held in November 2014. And all we did all of that basically for them to now take all of this information, break it down, pull it, and try to identify five key messages. Let's say if we're going to have a meeting with stakeholders, what are your five key points you want to bring to these people? If you can have a meeting with, say, somebody from the AIDS Bureau, somebody from Public Health Agency of Canada, somebody from AIDS Service Organization. So all of this stuff we presented today, the summit, the scoping review, the OCS data, and they ha they're working on it as we speak, trying to come up, trying to refine their key messages for this sort of next um, meeting. But some of them will be that, some of the things that they were throwing around with things that uh, straight men should also be considered a priority population. So they really want the gender piece to come through not just that you have to belong to an ethnic group or that you have to belong to a particular category. They really want the, the gendered nature of it to come through, that they're more than just these negative stereotypes, that they are, even though they're, they, all, they all want to be under this sort of umbrella of heterosexual men, under that identity, but they want a, the appreciation that they're this heterogeneous group with heterogeneous needs, and that they, they're open to collaboration as much as possible with other decision makers and uh, for, for services. This is sort of how things have come along, right? So this was like the, we had our first summit, scoping review of the literature, a second summit, and now moving forward, we're gonna have the a bigger knowledge translation forum with the policymakers and decision makers to see what happens. Well, first of all, we're gonna invite them and see who shows up. That's even gonna be telling as well, actually. Who comes, how many show up, that sort of thing. Um, but then to, um, and then their next step, so the next step is to host this meeting, hopefully sometime this year. And then also to develop an online community to put some of this stuff online and have um, a forum for them to be able to keep in touch um, other than these one meeting a year sort of things where um, they, don't think it's an, they don't think it's enough contact or connection. So has there been successes? Yes. There's some aid service organizations actually do have some programs now for straight men with HIV and have created positions for straight men with HIV. And some of the meds, and this was instigated by the participants themselves taking back um, the data, right? And showing it to their, the executive director of the aid service organization and saying, look, this is what we did. We need something. And so, for example, at the AIDS Committee of Ottawa, they're starting a group uh, called Arrow. I think it's supposed to be like straight as an arrow. Like, I, I, I guess. I'm not sure. I don't think it's green arrow. or I'm, I'm not sure. But, but so... Uh, so some uh, ASOs, APA as well, have started some uh, thing, and AIDS Niagara, I think, also started a group. Um, again, there's been some increased awareness, so we were able to get, for example, this special panel at the 2013 OH10 conference, and the participants themselves have been galvanized. They've been taking up other things. They've gone back to school to pursue, to pursue like, careers in social work and to do that, that sort of thing. 
So it's had some positive impacts, but there have been a lot of challenges. And one of them is also that it has galvanized participants. So as they do get galvanized, they see greener pastures elsewhere, right? Opportunities to make money with the skills they're picking up, right? So they can say they've done all of this thing, now they can apply for work. So, but, so you lose, so it's, it's a sort of double-edged sword because the, you invest, the, the training that goes into uh, is actually then, then it move, moves on to better things, obviously, but then the, the cost sort of suffers, right? The, the cost suffers because, again, you have a small pool to work with. Um, there's still not really, an, uh, to me, an identifiable leader within the group, right? Somebody who's really um, willing to go out there, to put themselves out there. Um, and sometimes whenever somebody gets really, really close to, to being that person or, see, or pushes themselves to be that person, they actually pull back. Like they really, um, suddenly the, the thought of being the face of something uh, is too scary and they just sort of pull back. So it really hasn't been that that uh, thing, even though I, I've told these guys, this can't be, this isn't going to be the Tony show, right? It's not going to work if it's the Tony show. It has to be about you guys. If it's going to be the, nobody's going to care, right? Like what I say, it has to be coming from, from you guys. So that still hasn't really happened. And there's still not, um, there's still not a dis distinct priority population. So there's been this pushback periodically, like whenever, when you're asking for letters of support for grants, let's say you get told by some people that, well, we've met and we decided that because this isn't a priority population, we're not going to support your your meeting or whatever. So there's still that kind of um, thing out there to sometimes overcome. So I want to acknowledge the, a lot of the CAB members and participants over the years who have, some have come and gone, but there's a core group who sort of stuck around and hung around and are sticking it out. A lot of, a lot of support from aid service organizations. Make sure, Ryan, that you don't edit that out. Lots of support from aid service organizations. Um, they've been very supportive uh, from across Ontario. They, they actually do see this as a need and a gap. So it's not, it, despite sometimes the way they, they be characterized, I think, in the research, I've had nothing but positive encounters with them around support for this work and, and trying to do something to really improve the, the lot of these guys. And then there's been a lot of funding uh, for this, from, mostly from CIHR um, through operating grants, planning grants, and dissemination grants. Um, like the qualitative study was an operating grant, the other two were, the other work has been through planning and dissemination grants. Um, and I should mention that I'm also funded by CIHR and OHTN um, at various times during this research. And, and that's it. That's the talk.